how am I supposed to believe that this is a highly skilled team capable of navigating the dangerous depths of the Mariana Trench when Statham is basically punching himself in the face every two minutes? <laughs> What's up guys and welcome back to another Shark Bites movie commentary. I'm sure that lots of you are going to enjoy today's film starring the one and only shark wrangler, Jason Statham. Yep, that's right, we're watching Meg 2, The Trench. The movie commentary that I did for the first film, check it out here by the way, was actually one of the first videos that I had on the channel that did quite well, so I'm actually really looking forward to this one. I can't imagine it's going to be much better than the first one in terms of its scientific accuracy, but we'll see. Quickly, just before we start though, sometimes when I do these movie commentaries, YouTube likes to copyright the shit out of me. On occasion, they come down with a hammer so hard that they completely block the video from 99% of countries, so none of you can watch it. I think the same thing happened to the movie commentary I did on The Reef, which you'll see has just completely disappeared from my channel. So to get around it, I sometimes edit my face into the middle of the screen while the movie is happening, and people tend to get quite grumpy about it. But I only do this because I want you guys to be able to watch the movie commentary that I've spent time making. The worst part about it though is I don't know whether I've gotten away with it until I upload the final edit to YouTube. If I haven't got away with it then I have to go back and re-edit the whole thing. So fingers crossed we don't have to put my stupid face in the middle of the screen this time. <laughs> right okay enough natter it's time to grab your favorite beverage sit back relax and enjoy this movie commentary of Meg to the Trench with a real life shark scientist. <laughs> Yes, great, okay, it looks like we've actually got away with the copyright thing this time. Anyway, we're starting off here in the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago, where these weird looking dino crocs are getting harassed by a T-Rex. Don't worry, we're going to get to those little rascals a bit later on. The T-Rex, after eating a dino croc, is quickly devoured by a breaching and then presumably beached megalodon. A megalodon that wouldn't even evolve on planet Earth for another 45 million years. Yep, that's right, these two prehistoric behemoths never actually encountered each other during their stints as species on Earth. Megs evolved about 20 million years ago during the Miocene era, so nowhere near the Cretaceous period. Saying that, we're about to get megalodons encountering humans as well, which also has never happened, so swings and roundabouts, I guess. Just rewinding it here though, I'd like to give some credit to the directors because megalodons were indeed coastal predators, cruising around looking for prehistoric whales, but it's pretty unlikely they launched themselves onto dry land to catch their food. They were fairly content just eating things that were swimming around in the sea. How steep is that drop off as well to allow a full breach like that? <laughs> Come on. Fast forward to present day and eco-warrior Jason Statham is breaking out of a shipping container somewhere in the Philippine Sea. How stupid do you think you'd have felt here if he was in one of the middle containers? <laughs> Turns out Jason has become some kind of James Bond-esque eco-spy, fighting the bad guys that are dumping toxic waste into the sea. He might as well have stuck him in a Greenpeace t-shirt. After a sweet double middles and a cool backwards dive into the sea, which has likely ruined all the camera equipment and SD cards he's just used to prove these guys are criminals, Statham is then scooped up by an aeroplane and flies off into the sunset. Oh look, they've got Iron Man suits now. That's exactly what we asked for when we wanted a second Meg film. That'll come in handy, I'm sure, at some point later in the film. So it turns out the mum of the little girl at some point between the two films has died Considering a line of work, you know, faffing around in deep sea submersibles and battling megalodons, I think that's no surprise. And it looks like now they've got a young megalodon held in captivity in this SeaWorld-like aquarium. Seems like a good idea, right? First little bit of shark science here for you though, the likelihood of this young megalodon being able to survive in captivity for an extended period of time is slim to none. We know these prehistoric sharks likely traveled massive distances around the ocean, patrolling the shallow waters of the Miocene, somewhat similar to today's large oceanic sharks. And today it's very unlikely you'll have large oceanic sharks in aquariums. Sharks like great whites, hammerheads, tiger sharks don't tend to do very well in captive scenarios and most end up dying pretty quickly. It's all because they have very specific habitat requirements to survive and when you have a shark species that travels huge distances, even an aquarium the size of this one, it's not going to be big enough. Okay, I guess maybe it's a juvenile so it's got somewhat of a better chance but 
I think it's unlikely it survives for that long. So this captive Megalodon looks like it's being trained by the owner of the company with some kind of clicking device. Now, I'm not going to give them too much credit because large sharks haven't been trained before by humans, but humans have successfully managed to train smaller shark species to perform tasks. Juvenile lemon sharks in particular have been trained to hit a target, and then if they hit that target, they get a food reward. So that shows the capacity of these animals to actually learn. Juvenile lemons have even been shown to pick up this skill 80 times faster than what it would take a cat or a rabbit to do, which is incredible. Check out the creature feature we did on lemon sharks via that link in the top right, by the way. I talk in depth about their learning behaviors and their social skills as well. Also this time, I'm gonna try and ignore the number of gill slits on this Megalodon, which does seem to have changed since the first film, by the way, where they had eight, now it's got seven. We're getting closer, guys. Two more gill slits to go. The captive megalodon they've got apparently has been behaving strangely all week, and here we see her deciding to break out of her enclosure during a full moon. I actually quite like this, to be fair, because we know that shark behavior can correlate with different lunar phases. There's some suggestion that shark attacks are statistically more likely during a full moon, and there have been studies showing that hammerhead shark behavior and their movements were often dictated by a full moon. I'm not sure if they've done this accidentally or intentionally here, but it's quite a cool little detail. As to exactly how she manages to slip away from her aquarium without anyone noticing, despite being fitted with a fancy beacon tracking device, I have no idea. <laughs> despite not learning their lessons from the first film, the Mana 1 team thinks it's a great idea to head back down past the thermocline and into the Mariana Trench. Come on guys, you know it's a bad idea. You released a Megalodon that killed a ton of people last time. Why are you still doing this? This time they're surrounded by lots and lots of megalodons who don't really seem to be interested in them at all, presumably because of the poorly explained predator countermeasures which are attached to the sides of the submersibles, which, uh, I don't know, making an electrical field or something? The team then stumble upon a mating aggregation of megalodons, which is quite cool to see in a shark film. It's not often been on display when I've watched shark films. Admittedly though, we've never seen large shark species mating, so we don't really know how they do it or even exactly where they do it. I think with the whole full moon thing and the meg escaping the aquarium, they might be suggesting that the moon has something to do with the mating aggregation. Although there's no real evidence yet as to whether this is a real thing, but it is an interesting hypothesis. After some big explosions and an underwater landslide, we get the next five minutes of the film where I literally can't see anything because it's so f***ing dark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go though. I can see the thermocline is now blown up. That's probably not good news. So the underwater explosions and landslides irreparably damage the subs, which means the crew get to use those fun Iron Man suits to walk across the Mariana Trench to some kind of underwater base that they just saw. My question here though is, if the intention is to not get seen or eaten by any rogue megalodons while they're walking, why haven't they got that funky orange lighting on that clearly makes it harder for Megs to spot them? They're literally wearing these bright white flashing beacons right now. <laughs> At least I don't have to deal with another five minutes of that horrendous orange light where I couldn't see a thing. Ah, spoke too soon. The wretched orange lights are back and I am plunged into the dark once again. I hope you guys are watching this in a dark room, by the way, because I wish I was. Looks like the Dinocrocs managed to survive several mass extinction events by hiding down here in the Mariana Trench with the Megalodons checks out. Thankfully, this guy uses Expecto Patronum to scare the Dino Crocs away, but that inadvertently attracts the Megalodons, despite them not being attracted to the white lights on their Iron Man suits five minutes earlier. <laughs> In a somewhat heroic attempt to save the crew from the oncoming Megalodons, he goes full Jurassic Park Jeff Goldblum, running off with a flare to distract them. Statham, on the other hand, realizes that running quickly underwater in a heavy Iron Man suit isn't the easiest thing to do, so he decides to take the flare and shoot it. But he doesn't shoot it away, or up to the surface, or anywhere else. He decides to shoot it into the metal structure that they then have to run underneath. The Megalodon, of course, clatters into it, destroying the metal structure, which sends flying underwater debris everywhere and knocks everyone to the ground. Somebody make this make sense. How am I supposed to believe that this is a highly skilled team capable of navigating the dangerous depths of the Mariana Trench when Statham is basically punching himself in the face every two minutes? <laughs> Miraculously, despite everyone shooting themselves in the foot during this mission, most of the team managed to make it into the underwater base where the true baddies are revealed to be engaging in some kind of secret mining operation to fund their technology business. And they say they're going to destroy the whole ocean in the process. Oh no. Apparently the only way for them to escape is for Statham to flood his sinuses with water and then hold his breath at 25,000 feet below sea level. 
I'm not entirely sure what would happen to the human body at depths and pressures of this level, but I'm pretty sure it's probably something like instant death. Regardless, he somehow survives, and they all manage to escape via the fat hole that's been blown in the thermocline, along with the Kraken. Meanwhile, at the Mana 1 rig, the baddies have seized control, and those who were left at the surface have been cornered into a room. They devise a brilliant plan to pepper spray the armed gunman in order to escape, but it's now Max's turn to punch himself in the face as he friendly fires his eyes into the pepper spray. <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy who Statham trusts with his life. The guy who rescues him from his daring missions out in the ocean by scooping him up with a plane. This guy. The guy who's just pepper sprayed himself to the face. Yes? It's from the thermocline breach, but you can relax. This place, meg proof. Yes, one of the chief baddies here decides to jinx the underwater glass, claiming it to be meg proof before inevitably getting rinsed. Statham and pals make it back up to the rig before stealing an inflatable boat to try and get away, and sensibly here they're smart enough to make sure that they don't turn the boat engine on because the underwater vibrations would attract one of the now many released megalodons. I'd say this probably checks out. Something like an engine motor is definitely going to be producing those low frequency vibrations that might be enough to alert a large predatory shark. Maybe they've stopped punching themselves in the face after all. The baddies, however, don't have the brains to figure this out in time and are duly chowed down on by a hungry Meg. They all then head to an island called Fun Island, perhaps appropriately named for all the fun everyone has there. The ratty dog from the first film notices the dolphins jumping out of the water, which lets us all know the Megs are on the way. Right, now, if you didn't think this movie had gone to shit before this point, you bloody will now. The Dinocrocs are somehow back and wreaking serious havoc to the inhabitants of Fun Island. Remember we saw these Dinocrocs right at the beginning during the Cretaceous period, and then they presumably survived the last 65 million years by living down in the Mariana Trench? So my question here is why have these Dinocrocs, despite spending the last 65 million years underwater, not evolved to the point where they perhaps lost their ability to survive on land? Surely they'd have evolved some gills and lost their ability to breathe air on the land, or maybe their limbs would have evolved to become entirely water-based appendages. I guess we just ignore the most fundamental environmental process of natural selection and evolution because the director wanted Dinocrocs to smash up Fun Island. After an hour and 20 minutes, we finally get to the bit that everyone wanted to see from this sequel, Megalodon going ham on hapless human beings in pedalos. I like how the Meg here decides to ignore all these tasty snacks and rubber rings and instead dives headfirst into the wooden boardwalk. Treated wooden planks are, of course, one of Megalodon's five a day. <laughs> In his usual bid to save the day, Statham heads out on a jet ski to lure the Megalodons away from Fun Island, armed with explosive javelins. After a few sweet jet ski barrel rolls and some exploding darts, Statham literally, and I guess figuratively as well, jumps the shark, surfing that breach splash like it's a 20-foot wave from one Megalodon, and then expertly blows up the second one in the face. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at Fun Island, the Kraken has decided it's had enough of these pesky humans as well and proceeds to try and smash up the place. Why is there a Kraken? Why did they do this? They could have featured any other cool prehistoric shark species, but they went with this. It's probably for the slow-mo jumps or something. Statham, who's now found himself back at Fun Island with a Megalodon hot in pursuit, ends up on a piece of smashed boardwalk and proceeds to do his best Quint impression from Jaws. I like that. There's a nice little nod. These Megs sure do love chomping on wood, though. Whee! The Kraken continues to wreak havoc on innocent civilians, but this guy who's assembled a homemade bomb dives in to blow it up. The bomb detonates, but seemingly does little damage as the Kraken then reaches up and grabs him by the leg, where he's nearly devoured by that wretched beak before a Megalodon, of course, comes to save the day. Megalodon and Kraken are then locked in a titan death grip, beast versus beast, but it's Megalodon who comes out on top, duly shredding the Kraken's face to bits. Coming to the end now, surely. Surely this is nearly the end. Anyway, Statham heads over to save Mac, who somehow managed to survive a pretty devastating helicopter crash onto partially submerged rocks. He uses a bit of smashed up helicopter as a giant kebab skewer and perfectly impales the Megalodon right through its mouth and out the top of its head. Shut up, Meg. Anyone fancy a barbecue Meg kebab? Thankfully, after all that devastation and carnage, there's always time for a rum on the beach with your mates. The end. And there we go, guys. That was Meg 2 The Trench. I don't really know where to start, to be honest. It was all just 
ridiculous. Realism score has got to be pretty low on that one then, despite them featuring some cool things like the stuff about the lunar phases and shark mating. But that's the thing with these Megalodon films, it's never going to be realistic. That Dino Croc stuff though really did piss me off. It doesn't make any sense. So for that reason, it's getting a 2 out of 10 for realism. And then for overall entertainment, it was somewhat enjoyable, but I don't think I enjoyed it as much as the first film, which was still ridiculous, but less so, if you get what I mean. So yeah, overall entertainment, it's getting a 4 out of 10. What'd you make of my ratings then? Do you think I slagged it off a little bit too much? Did you guys enjoy the film? Make sure you let me know all your thoughts in the comments. Please also do comment some of the films that you guys want to see movie commentaries on, by the way. If you enjoyed this video though, please, please do give it a like. It's really appreciated. Before you head off though, during that ridiculous movie commentary, I did speak to you briefly about how lemon sharks can be taught to perform tasks. Well, this is the video right here where I go in depth into lemon sharks. Some of the social and behavioral stuff that we've learned about them is unbelievable. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, make sure you check it out here.